Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cooper, as Lucas said. Uh, I have a very thick Australian accent, so I will try and speak slow, but as I get excited and I speed up, just yell out, slow down. Uh, I do that often. Uh, so who am I? I'm Cooper Lees. I've been at Meta for a very long time, since 2013. Uh, there's many ex-coworkers here and co-workers here. I've been all over Infra. The first team I started sort of firefighting and keeping our website up at all costs. Uh, in 2013, Meta was a very different company. Um, it was uh, alarm fighting at its finest. Uh, I sort of spent some time in network. I've been in our sort of Python foundation team and now I'm sort of in our operating systems provisioning team. So getting the uh, OS onto our servers as quick as we can uh, so that we can re-image our servers more often and there's a number of reasons we do that. Uh, I'm currently in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I used to be in California for years but I've escaped California. So uh, living there. So what I do, I kind of said, uh, I, I joined the sort of provisioning team about two years ago and the goal was we wanted to be A, more reliable because we were failing and retrying too much and we wanted to do it faster. Why fast? We want to try and make sure in a three month window that every server in our fleet has been revisited. Uh, doing that for millions of servers, quite a job. Uh, and we do it. I'm happy to say that we do that. So I'm going to go into why do we monitor PID1, what made me do this. Uh, there was previous talks from my coworker Davide about this uh, and we have got there. Uh, I'm going to go over again how we use and where we use systemd again at Meta. It's been told before, but I'll go over it pretty quickly just so you know. Uh, it has changed a little bit since previous talks. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how we do monitor systemd and why, uh, and then go into sort of how I've open sourced it. So you two will be able to sort of monitor your systemd if you would like to. I'm going to allude to some of my home boxes. So I just wanted to show my extremely overly complicated home network. When you take a network guy out of a network uh, sort of team, I get bored. So at home, I have far too many internet connections and uh, home routers, and it's all network D powered. Thus my network D question before. Uh, I'm a big fan and I want to see Linux unified uh, and all the V6 work that you've done lately, awesome. I'm also an IPv6 zealot. Uh, I worked a lot on the V6 stuff at Meta. So over drinks, happy to talk about it. The main two boxes you're going to see in my example is my home one router and my home two router. And I also want to say uh, all my VPN is driven by WireGuard and Network D. Awesome extraction, love it. So what do we care about monitoring PID1? System D just works, it never breaks. And it's, for the most part, pretty true. System D itself very rarely screws up unless you're doing crazy things on embedded systems and forgetting to include things at once. Luckily in my world, I'm a CentOS distribution and uh, it, it, for the most part, we have everything we need. That's not completely true in our NetRDs. We sort of skim and pull parts that we want to make our NetRD smaller so all firmwares are happy because some firmwares are upset if your NetRD is too big. So there we have ran into the fun, we're missing this, missing that. So those, those better logging messages would be awesome. So systemd, I'm not going to really explain what it is. We all know it is. It's the building block of our Linux and making the server do something useful for us. Um, but do you know how much CPU PID1 is using? Do you know how much memory PID1 is using? Do you know how many open file descriptors PID1 has across your fleet? Why does this server over here have 600 and this one over here 60 when they do the same thing? They run a container and do some workload. Uh, and we have found boxes like this. You know, when you upgraded systemd, has this changed? It shouldn't have, but you know, we can identify regressions. Uh, this has made Darn very happy. For those who don't know, Darn Demure, contributor, works in, uh, uh, at Meta. I will probably say Darn's name a few times. Then we can take it one step further and think about your overall user space health. You know, uh, how are you using Linux? Does this you know, group of servers you know, named X look like one another. Do these ones over here do what you expect? So comparing you know, our servers that run our web workload for uh, facebook.com or instagram.com uh, are quite different to our you know, big AI machines running uh, accelerator workloads. So representing that at the system D level lets us know that the boxes are sort of set up correctly. You know, I can tell you, you know, how many service units we have, how many mount units we have, et cetera, et cetera, across our fleet. And then the most important thing, we can now tell that if there's a failed unit, and it helps us identify, you know, if a core unit has slipped under the radar and started failing, you know, we can go and fix it at either provisioning time, during the box's run time, et cetera, et cetera. And then my favourite are all my NICs routable. Being a network guy, you know, with all these back-end networks now, we can actually get alarms and see uh, which back-end networks have somehow become unroutable with the, with the status from Network D. So my home router has 654 units. Uh, that's my primary one. Uh, it runs a whole range of containers and overly engineered because I, I use it as a play box. Uh, I have 22 timer units and seven managed interfaces. 
Useless numbers, but just showing I know that. Do you know that about your box? Uh, my backup router, surprisingly different. Even though I use Ansible to, to configure both of the boxes, uh, it has vastly less uh, units, vastly less timing units. I don't know why. And uh, only six managed interfaces. It only has, well, it has two internet. I don't know why it has less interfaces, but it does. <laughs> it has a 5G and a fiber connection, so I don't know. So we all know SystemD has a wealth of uh, our metrics. Uh, there's a lot. So uh, when I looked at them, I, I went and sort of hand selected. I want to make that configurable one day of what makes most sense for most of our services, containers, etc. So memory usage, CPU time, uh, end restarts, etc. I pull. Um, but we, there's a wealth of much more information there that we could extend and use in the, in the daemon that I pull. Right now, we're all pulling it by DBus. I'm very excited to move to Varlink. Uh, Dan keeps telling me Lennart won't let him merge stuff. So if you could, <laughs> Lennart, that would be great. I, I, my goal was really to have it, my Varlink ready for this talk, but I didn't get there. Um, 2017, as I said, David Kavalka talked about uh, early prototypes of doing exactly what uh, MonoDB I'm going to talk about does. Uh, I just wanted to say that talk does exist if you want to go back to it, but we have made it and we now have our whole fleet uh, managed and quantified. Why do we want to quantify? I know we're all software engineers and sysadmins and we know, but I challenge you to never accept just works. Even if system D hasn't caused you a problem, I guarantee if you start looking at these things, you're going to find weird edge, case, weird edge, edge cases in your fleet. Uh, I have some examples later on and, and how we use it and where it's really, really helped. Then I'm going to share the absolute key, which is what does good look like? A lot of people do not know what their good looks like and having that baseline when anything does go bad is the best thing to have. So being the team that puts OSs on the box to know that they're all going out looking very similar is very helpful. So when other people go, these aren't working anymore, I can go, well, they left me the same and here's the data to prove it. Where we usually fail is what system D controls. And this is what I was most uh, upset about when I joined the provisioning team. The server left provisioning and had high single digit numbers of failed units. We found out a lot of them were timers trying to run when a directory doesn't exist yet or you know, chef hadn't set something up. So that had uh, created the state which would never clear until that reruns, etc. So we had a lot of that. So we were faced with this kind of output when it would leave provisioning, you would have Foo bar and you know log rotate was one that always surprised me that would be failed, um, and I was like, why? Why is this failed? And I went through and cleaned up a lot, and we now leave provisioning with zero failed units, and it makes me you know makes us again have that guarantee that we can say the box is ready to take a workload. So when I say imaging provisioning, uh, it basically means putting you know our OS our OS is CentOS. I'll go into a little more detail about that, and it's a slight variation from CentOS. But I want to just guarantee, being the provisioning team, that I'm giving you know, the workload a box that will work for them. And that's making sure that uh, our image has got there successfully, uh, system D has started everything, and our chef runs finish. An example that we commonly hit, some new bug comes out, we send thousands of boxes into prod because our imaging is pretty quick now. Uh, and we have to pull a handbrake on the system, work out what it is, and usually re-image those thousand boxes or put a hack in Chef to clean it up in some way. And then we push the new image with the fix or Chef diff that needs the fix and we continue provisioning again. Uh, there are hundreds to thousands of jobs reprovisioning servers all around the world at any time at Meta. So uh, when it breaks, uh, we can eat into a lot of our capacity and we don't want to do that. Uh, an example is, uh, from provisioning sometimes, uh, we, have, we have a script to drop in a uh, system D state when we go from our init RD into the rootfs. Uh, we have leaked things through there and caused the boot order to really, really be unhappy because uh, system D thinks that it's already at uh, you know, a crazy late target, uh, like network's already up, everything's already up and things just all started at once. Uh, and we didn't really detect that one for a while, for a day or so. And all these boxes were in production, booting system D, not running this uh, script because we'd uh, up, Dan had upgraded some boxes to a new system D, clobbering our dropping of the state between the init RD system D and the root of S, and we had all kinds of weird, wonderful errors. We were printing system D analyzers and putting them on the wall and going, what is going on? So it was very hard to work out, and I didn't ever want to do it again, because uh, I'm a lazy Australian, we don't like to work hard, so whatever I can do to not work hard again, I will do. All right. 
So system D usage at Meta. Let's go over where we use it and how we use it in 2024. Uh, millions of servers. It is all CentOS based, but we use the hyperscale SIG uh, versions of things. Uh, we have many contributors on staff, as we know. Um, and we're running currently 255.5 fleet wide. Uh, the 256, I think, Dan started it this week magically, so I can claim we're rolling it out. But it hasn't really started yet, so I, I'm not going to claim that we have. If you haven't heard of the CentOS Hypersales gig, uh, it's, a, it's a, a group we want you to come and join and, and help co uh, collaborate with that just brings more modern things to CentOS. Um, you know, newer system D, working with newer kernels, and we're a big butter of fish shop at Meta. So system D at Meta is in many different parts, and I'll go through some of them in, in a little more detail. Uh, we have two init RDs there. We'll talk about a disk init RD and an imaging init RD. The imaging init RD is what we boot into when we net boot to pull down like our rootfs, our disk init RD, our bootloader, etc., uh, to put onto the system. Uh, our main OS that we'll talk about, we'll talk about is the rootfs. Uh, it's an image we build, another butterfs sub-volume that we will drop and boot into. And then when I talk about twine containers, or I'll probably say Tupperware, because that's what it's called internally. Uh, but our twine containers, for trademark reasons, um, uh, are our containers that are also all system D powered and start the service that way, and becoming more and more system D uh, ecosystem containers. So our init RDs, uh, it's where PID1 just basically drives uh, that, whatever that init R needs to do. Uh, the, as I said, the imaging init RD goes and fetches the packages. The disk init RD drops some config we need uh, drop down before we uh, switch root into the main rootfs and, and the main config files that we need to make systemd do what we want. Here, we don't really use monitord or the, the monitoring that I'm talking about today. Here, we hard fail. Uh, and we push the error back up to our provisioning UI and we debug that way. Uh, and we have some, some of our systems automatically log the console so we can go and grab the console output and, and see what happens, if it happens to be on the right hardware SKU where console logging's working that day. Not always working, uh, but when it does, it's great. But usually I have to repro it, redo it, watch the console myself. Uh, very slow on big uh, AI hardware when there's so much damn hardware that the kernel enumeration of hardware itself takes three minutes. The rootfs, this is where I'll be focused today. So as I said, it's a butterfs subvolume that we pull down and add, is, uh, add in. Uh, we send send streams around. Uh, this is our main uh, sort of OS that does our workload on the majority of our fleet. Uh, we're IPv6 only hosts. Uh, we, um, as I said, are a full network D shop as well. Uh, so I believe we're probably one of the biggest network D shops in the world. <laughs> so Twine going over a little bit, PID1 in all our containers, uh, you know, is the, is the system D PID1. We're moving more and more there. Uh, this is a work in progress. We're not all there. Monitor D that I am going to talk about is not used there a lot yet, uh, but we'll see if it makes sense in the future. Uh, our Twine agent uh, pulls a lot of stats and pushes that up to our monitoring system and has been around since the since the dawn of time. So it and host agent do the, bu the bulk of our container monitoring. So that rootfs I talked about, building that, I just want to sort of slightly go over how we, how we do build that. But basically we're a, a buck uh, build system and, uh, company and we use a, a th homegrown Antler 2 system that eventually just builds butterfs uh, send streams with all the files we want. So if you've never seen a buck uh, target file it's called, uh, it's like a Starlark Python-like syntax where you define what you need, give me some RPMs, make a send stream. We put that up into our, our uh, blob distribution system called FPPKG, and we pull it down and download. Um, we are, as I said, a CentOS-based RPM distro, so our rootfs is pretty much CentOS. Much more modern CentOS, I'd like to call it. So looking at that in a diagram, we're nerds, so from left to right is sort of the flow. You'll see at the top, I sort of alleviate to our slow path of provisioning a box, and at the bottom I talk about our fast path. So I'll go through the slow path first, a normal sort of reboot the box, net boot, go into the imaging init RD, pull down all our images, boot our disk init RD, then we switch root into our rootfs, and then we reach workload.target. Workload.target is where sort of monitor D comes in and looks at system D and reports back to you know, our systems on how everything is, and we aggregate that up and look at things uh, at an aggregated value because 
sending millions of keys isn't cheap, right? So uh, we have to aggregate it. The fast path, the only main difference there is we have the ability to pre-download the new rootfs and kexec into it. It was very similar to what was explained by SUS with the sub-volume usage for a new rootfs to boot into. Uh, so we basically do that into our disk init RD, then boot the rootfs and, and, and reach the same tree. On our, on our normal workload server, it cuts off about three minutes. So every minute counts. Now I'm going to talk about how we upgrade systemd at Meta. Uh, we use a, a, a hyperscale SIG uh, CI pipeline called system, what we, well, I think Darn called systemd CD, where we take master, build it, pull it internally, and then I use that version in my image. And I boot, and I see if my init RDs work, and I see if my uh, rootfs continues to work. The, way, the nice thing about this is when it doesn't work, we can open an issue where it's still top of mind because it's only recently been committed. And I can say to Dan, hey, it broke, what should we do? And that's what we've sort of been doing. Then from there, there's another side of how we roll systemd. On the boxes that are already out there with the old systemd, we, we, we slowly roll it out to the fleet. So if we're on 255, and like I said, Dan's starting to roll 260 now, uh, where it would be is probably on some of our test tiers right now, seeing on, that, that have some test workloads to see that they don't die in any way or have difficulties. And then we slowly go 1%, 2%, 5%. And slowly roll it out over our infrastructure. Uh, and then Darn gets to play whack a mole on the bug fixes, uh, which is not always fun for him. <laughs> but we, we're, we're thinking of maybe reversing that uh, and getting more CI, or we're not sure yet, but changing system D why the box has a workload, kind of risky. Uh, so we might look at other ways to do that and reduce that risk. Uh, we haven't really talked about it yet, but that's basically how we upgrade it. And having you know, the metrics where we can see. Uh, the changes between system D version, memory usage, the unit, if the unit counts change somehow, um, there might be some new ones that have sprung up on by default, which have bit us. Um, it, it's been handy to have those metrics when we roll it out. Some examples that, that, that this has found, uh, when protect system equals true became a default in the init RD, we were dropping some files to user, probably a dumb thing to do anyway. Uh, so it was good, we cleaned it up, I moved those files to be dropped to run where they should be. And I was able to keep that feature on and we were ready for when we started rolling that new version. Uh, it's, very, it's much nicer to debug this when I'm sitting at my desk enjoying my coffee, working it out, rather than you know, 30, you know, 1,000 servers broken and provisioning not happening. So having that forethought and, and, and failing you know, months before we start rolling it out is, is very nice. Uh, and then in our rootfs, we actually hit with some, some of the new TPMs uh, units that have been added in. Uh, having issues because uh, our, our TPMs were already locked, password protected, and the units were just crashing and dying because they couldn't do anything. Uh, I think this comes back to Jonathan's talk about how the server world and the desktop world and TPM usage vastly different. So let's go back into what my actual talk's about and talk about monitoring system D once our systems are up. What I wanted to know was really paired one's resource usage the unit types and how we're actually using systemd, and I wanted to know the unit state. Is it good or is it bad? I'm a simple man, good, bad. So I went and looked around what existed, uh, and there wasn't a whole lot. Uh, for those who have ever used Prometheus Node Exporter, I use it at home, I love it. Uh, it had a systemd extension, so I enabled that and wanted to see what I could get out of it. Uh, and then there was a data dog offering. I've never used it. If anyone has, I'd love to know what it does, but I had to pay money to see that, and that, you know, that scared me away. So I made a, a Grafana dashboard of what uh, the systemd extension for uh, Node Exporter gave me, and it gave me very similar things to what I wanted, but not everything. So I got unit counts. They had some cool stuff about uh, sockets accepted if you're using socket units, etc. I don't particularly use many, so as you can see, there's nothing on my home boxes. Uh, I want to point out that, that version, the version strings at the bottom, all my boxes are 255 except my lame NVR, so if anyone here works at Unify or Ubiquity, please get me a newer system D. Um, oh, damn, I shouldn't have named a vendor. Um, but um, yeah, so that's sort of the information I found out there. So Node Exporter gave me the unit counts, the system D version, but what it didn't give me, what I, what I also wanted was I wanted PID1 itself uh, resource usages. I wanted the system state, if you've ever ran system CTL, is system running? Uh, it's a very helpful metric. Uh, and then I wanted some basic network D for our multi NIC boxes. So I wrote monitor D. And I put there in brackets FB because inside we have a slightly different version. And I'll go into detail of how it does differ inside. 
So at a diagram level, basically monitor D in the center there, the big green uh, round square, uh, talks to PROCFS and DBUS to get most of its data. I do an evil thing, and I want to talk of this as evil, but I read run systemd netf links to get the state and the, all the links that network D is caring about. Uh, I know it says, do not pass this, you're evil, blah, 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 uh, but I do. So, because uh, I couldn't find the data anywhere else. So, what my plan was there was to work with Dan to get it into some Vilink APIs so that I could get that data out in a nicer way so I, I don't break when you break that one day because it's private. Uh, so there, dotted line to Vilink. I was hoping to have that done by this talk. We're still all DBus. Um, so looking forward to that. So I went uh, and made what I like to call enumer enumeration uh, data sets. In Facebook, most of our monitoring to scale it is a very simple key and value. So an integer and a key and an entity to group those keys. So I wanted to just make enumeration representation of systemd active state, load state, uh, and then all the network states, and we send those integers up and then just use math to work out how the fleet is percentage-wise, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I wanted to be really low on resources, and I think I, almost, I, I pretty much achieved that apart from statically linked Rust binaries, but we'll talk about that. So it is all in Rust. Good joke. How do you know a Rust developer? Don't worry, they'll tell you. Um, but it's all uh, a binary basically parsing uh, uh, Dbus and turning it into JSON. Uh, why JSON? Uh, the, the, the original way that I thought that I was going to uh, deploy this was an agent at Facebook that wraps binaries and it needs a certain form of JSON to send that off to key value pairs. I eventually changed that and ran it as a daemon, uh, but I kept the JSON output for open source so you can run it on your command line and, and, and get it. Uh, at Meta we use it as a library and when I get to talk about it in a bit my monitor D exporter uh, also uses a library. I apologize whenever you go to the GitHub. This was my first ever Rust. I've tried to clean up as much as I can. Uh, there's still more to be cleaned up. So the binary is about 1.4 megabytes, steadily linked and stripped. I wasn't too upset with that. Working at Meta, our binaries are vastly larger, so I thought that was pretty cool. But then I went, I wonder what system D is, and I went, oh, I kind of suck. I'm monitoring a system that does a hell of a lot more, and I'm 1.4 meg, but static binary. Uh, monitor D is config driven. Uh, all options in an INI format to make it familiar to what you're used to. Uh, I particularly am not an INI fan, but it works. Uh, and just some examples there of saying monitor crony, grab its extra keys. Um, if you want to monitor units or only monitor system state, this would all let you do like do less on an embedded system. If you only wanted to know if the system's good or not, you could only collect system state and you would save memory, etc. cetera. Um, can't, don't support yes or no for bulls. As always, PR welcome. So what's this sort of look like? If you go and run monitor D from the command line or from a checkout, uh, you'll just get some output and a whole bunch of JSON. So there you can see that I have a, on whatever box this was, I think it's my, yeah, it's my VPS in America, uh, 169 service units. You can see that three is the system state. That's an enumeration int value. So we have uh, running there. And you can see my version is 255.4. Uh, so my home is older than Facebook. That's pretty ironic, but it is. <laughs> awesome. Uh, FB Monitor D that I talked about uh, at Meta is basically uh, running as a crate. We wrap it in a thrift server. Everything at Meta is thrift. Thrift, if you don't know what that is, it's just like a gRPC uh, uh, RPC framework and, and IDL language. So I basically wrap it in that, which gives us a lot more APIs to, to, to do more stuff. So it sits there and runs uh, across our daemon, across our fleet. Uh, there's some APIs that we call, so provisioning. Um, I thought that was, that was very cool. I asked, all my, a lot of my pictures are MetaMate uh, uh, generated, so that's apparently a lot of logs on a computer. Um, great work, MetaMate, AI's killing it. I'm so glad we spent so much power on it. Um, <laughs> um, but it's, it's cool. Uh, so I added some frist states because our, our provisioning workflow engine calls out to MonitorD after we finish all the provisioning or we think we finished everything and says, hey, is everything healthy? If not, I'm gonna fail the job. Uh, so we have that guarantee that I said that, that says the box leaves provisioning in a healthy state that we want it to be in. And this has caught many subtle bugs and, and new services failing or a new version of you know, one of our needed binaries not starting at, at boot time, et cetera. Uh, another thing the internal system done that's extremely helpful, we have a system inside and anyone that's ever worked at Facebook is the number one thing they miss when they leave called scuba. It's a big JSON blob system we throw logs at and then you can slice and dice. Uh, this gives me very nice metrics to say, you know, what data center, what region, what host names, et cetera, are failing 
unit X. Uh, and I have that for both non-routable interfaces and failing system D units, and it's been extremely helpful, and I love seeing people use it in SEVs as rec uh, uh, you know, outage reports for recovery metrics, etc. It makes me feel the work, the work was worth it. Any Fedora users in the house? All right. Great news for you guys. You can DNF install it. So if you DNF install MonitorD or DNF install MonitorD exporter, minus my bug, uh, they will both work out of the bat. You'll have to uh, either symlink or hack to get the uh, exporter working because uh, I used user local bin on my home installs and uh, on Fedora we installed in user bin. My bad. Uh, so nice, easy install. Uh, it's there, you can start seeing stats, you could write something to wrap it to, to, to push to your uh, aggreg you know, metrics aggregation system of choice, and away you go. Monody Exporter, as I said, also just uses it as a, as a library. Uh, it's open telemetry, so it's Prometheus Exporter uh, compliant. Prometheus pulls that, and uh, you, you can get a nice Grafana dashboard. So what, what does that look like? If you do sudo dnf install, you have to do that hack in the yellow at the bottom, but let's ignore that, we'll fix that eventually. Uh, you can then curl and get that same monitor D system state now in the format that OpenTelemetry wants. And another example showing you know, interface names in, in that format again. I said I wanted to try and keep it tight on resources, so on, on my small VPS in the US, um, you can see that it's been running for about a week. Uh, we have about eight tasks, so I guess eight file descriptors and threads. Uh, you can see the peak memory is about 3.1 megabytes. I'm sitting at 1.8 megabytes, so I want it to be light footprint, so it's pretty light footprint to get base metrics. These servers aren't pulling the full gamut of stats of like per service statistics. My configs very uh, boring here, uh, but as you can see, not heavy and gives you a, a, a nice insight to how your system's running. I have made and uploaded, if you are a Grafana user, a dashboard. So if you do install this and get it into Prometheus, uh, there is a dashboard ready for you to go. Uh, that's apparently what my dashboard looks like according to Metamate. Looks very nice there, I must say. Uh, actually looks better than my real one. But here's my real one that's much more boring but actually means stuff. Uh, you can see all the different types of systemd units. Uh, active, inactive, failed. You can see the green love heart up there. Uh, that means that I don't have an alarm right now, but if any unit does fail, my phone will buzz. Let's hope I don't get one now. It's on silent anyway. But uh, mount units, mast units, socket units, all the kind of stuff to see how your system's used. We're all nerds, we love graphs, graphs are cool. Then I have the network D sort of stats further down on the dashboard. You can see there how many ma uh, interfaces are managed by network D. Uh, on my VPSs, you'll see there's a lot less. That's because uh, wherever I host that one, they don't use network D, but I do for my WireGuard VPN. Uh, and then my other two home routers that I alluded to earlier. Uh, I then also, I, I look at the admin state, carrier state, opera state, and then the address state. I only care about v6, but I monitor both. Uh, and then the fa my favorite one that allowed us to get the boot to be much more quicker at meta that we were abusing for a long time, the wait for online, and tuning wait for online to only wait for the right interfaces that we actually care about to be up at boot time. So we got that right on our multi-NIC AI cluster, and that saved you know, 30, 30 plus seconds of sitting there waiting for the back end NICs to come up. I don't care to provision the server, I only need the primary NIC, and they usually come up uh, during the provisioning. I'll, I'll say usually. Uh, then the PID1 stats itself, like even in my home small network, like it's very strange. Like, why does my, uh, on the very far top right, why does my Australian VPS that does pretty much everything my American VPS does, why does it use so much less uh, memory? You know, 10 megabytes versus 14. I don't know, I haven't looked into it, but it does. Um, and so you can see there's uh, various, various things there, and all I'm using there is ProcFS and, and looking at things. So happy to add other meaningful things. I asked Darn what would help him, uh, you know, when we roll new system D uh, versions, and that's sort of what I came up with. And at the very bottom there, we have uh, the running state. So all my boxes are three, healthy, no failed units. I'm a great sysadmin, go me. Home success story. Uh, I pulled out an old UPS that died, it hit, it died, and I forgot I had a very evil watchdog unit that would restart that service every now and then because we all know how reliable things connected by USB are. It would just randomly stop responding. It was also a very cheap UPS, but um, it just stopped dying, so I had a, a, a watchdog unit that would just restart it, 
Uh, and you can see there on the graph, it, would, it kept doing it. And I'm like, what, what's going on here? So I stopped it, disabled it. And I did that twice, as you can see in the graph, because I forgot about the watchdog unit. Uh, and then I eventually, you know, just had to do the right thing and, and kill my, oh, I named a vendor again, damn it. Um, but yeah, I, I, killed, I killed the, uh, the UPS uh, watchdog and, and all was good and my, my, my boxes stayed happy again. Had I had this, I probably would have forgot there and, and just left it, uh, left it alone. So just to recount, uh, system D just works. I never accept that. Uh, as a lot of my coworkers know, I'm kind of annoying. Uh, but I never accept anything just works. Uh, if it does just work, I want data to tell me that it just works. Uh, know what good is in your environment. That's always a goal of any service you do. I'm very disappointed when I, I meet service owners who don't know what good looks like when we're, when we're in an outage. Uh, that's always a follow-up I'll attach to that outage sort of report. Uh, so this helps us. I, I, I don't ever want to be a hypocrite, so this area was vastly unquantified, so I quantified it. Uh, it also has been happy, uh, helpful to see the differences between system D versions. Again, having numbers on things um, you know, allows you to know when things go bad. And alarm it. Humans aren't going to look at this data, so get some alarms in there on high-hitting, you know, good signal alarms, and uh, you, know, you can be lazier, and I like being lazier. There's a lot of things I'd like to add. I'd love some PRs. I want to move to v, uh, Varlink or ZBus. The only reason I didn't go to ZBus originally is because I was new to Rust. Async and uh, traits scared me. I now kind of understand them. Uh, no one truly understands them, but uh, I, I'm going to look to, if, if, not, if I'm not getting my Varlink APIs anytime soon, um, I will probably move to ZBus and, and, and do that work uh, and see. And I want to AB compare my synchronous Rust versus the Async and see who's cheaper. Uh, the, if it turns out the Async's more overhead and costs me more CPU order, I'll probably get rid of it. Um, but yeah, I want to see some cool things, like I'd love to see boot time statistics and shutdown. I'd love to see if we could dump some state about units that hold up the shutdown. Again, why we do profile switches at, at real time at Meta. So like when a job comes along and I'm job X, I need some host level stuff changed and sometimes that is some syscatils or a kernel version we have to reboot or k-exec. I'd like to see what slows us down doing that. Uh, again, the quicker it is, the quicker we get the workload on there, the more money we make and the more bonus I get. So very important. Um, General Z statistics, I'd love to see uh, error, you know, error rates. You know, I'd love to see all boxes in the same sort of characteristic role, that the error log rate is zero. It's never going to be, but at least the same. Because uh, if you could see a box that has 5,000 error level logs or emergency, and the rest don't, probably something worth looking into. Uh, and, and it goes on and on. I'd love to support the, the system D and spawn natively from the one instance and send all the keys from the one monitor D so we don't have to run it everywhere. And I'd love to hear your ideas. Open issues, I mightn't get to them, but uh, I'll try. Thanks. Question. Yeah. Also, if you like uh, set, uh, Linux and provisioning and all that, we have an open position in my team. So come and talk to me. If yes, board my, uh, yeah. Excellent. Questions? I have a question. Um, do you export C group metrics on IO CPU memory? Uh, I do not. Uh, ah. I'd be, be interested in doing so. Yeah, yeah okay. We, do, in, we, we already had it in another daemon at Meta, and we right. do it, so I didn't double up, but we should probably move that into this. That would be nice. That's one of the main things, new things that we are starting to monitor at Azure, uh, the C group memory. Yep. Statistics. If you can give me example code to copy and whatnot, even better. Questions? Any question? I mean, it's not so much a question. Um, I mean, I like, like this a lot. Um, uh, but I, I, I was thinking about, like, I, I kind of sense we should turn this um, around so that instead of you asking all this data from, from system should push D, to me. Um, well, no. So, you, you know, in the, in the TPM context, um, I was, um, like, I mentioned. He got the, TPN into my talk. Yeah, I did. He did it, I ladies did. and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, I was thinking, like, um, you know, I have the, the quote stuff and things like this. So I was always, like, back when I thought about that, like, like I, I want to get information about the runtime of uh, runtime state of the OS into these um, um, assigned uh, reports about the system. So I was thinking about that. That yeah, so basically, I want all kind of information. Um, included in a, in a signed report that you can then uh, analyze somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so the way I was thinking about how we could implement that in that system report binary, which is mostly about TPM, but could probably just also just not do TPM, yeah. that, that there would be a directory in slash run where any 
component on the system can just uh, bind a socket into and would implement the same wireling interface. Um, and then system report would just connect to every single one of them in parallel, basically, and ask them, please give me the, the report of whatever you, uh, you have right now. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we would implement that in journal D, we would implement that in network D, we would implement it in everything else we have. Mm -hmm. um, and they would just basically um, provide the data for free, right? Because like, so, um, it's already there, right? Like, ready to yeah, just and then suck, they, they yeah. natively handle all of this, so it would just be an additional way to get the stuff. But basically, yeah, you would basically have the directory, you can either talk to the services directly yep. and get the individual stuff, or you, you Use system report. We will just uh, blow out um, messages to calls to all of them at the same time, and then return your uh, combined JSON stuff. And yeah. then, if you do the TPM stuff, we'll also sign it for you and do remote attestation. Yep. Uh, yeah, this could what just. Stuff, the stuff that we talk, talked about metrics, D, but that's a yeah. different thing. Because, because the, the 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 stuff we talked about then is about time series data, right? Like, and this one is is not so much, right? Like, this is about getting a, a this is all time which, series too. Yeah. 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 So um, I don't know. I, I think we should do something like this, uh, and then basically, happy to talk. Um, you get all our data for free, um, and then but this would be open the directory for anybody to bind whatever they want, and there would be even delegation model, right? Like that you can. Yep. Gonna have an end spawn container that binds something there that gets the data from its payload and things like this. So um, you get basically a recursive dump of everything um, on the system um, in all the detail you want, mm. um, because you could configure the in real service to, to, to report as little or, or yeah or, filter and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as much as you want. And then uh, yeah, this could be the agent that everybody calls. Yeah. I mean, this was just the model that I was going yeah, for. I, I, because I'm not a fan of agents, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like uh, all these super. Vision thinks they always install the little agent, trying to pull everything out. It's very inefficient, and particularly in DBus. Um, yeah, and then this yeah. way, we, we turn it all around because mm -hmm. uh, we just give you a ready-made report. And yeah, and this and this would just turn into a proxy at Meta, where I'd have to, I'd probably have to expose it by Thrift still, but that's all it would do. And I'm very excited with Violink using the the the, the um, IDL with Thrift IDL to magically make it just convert. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Comments or questions? Wow, I thought I'd get grilled, so this is good. How much time do you have? Two minutes. Going once. Going twice. Well, thank you. All right.